first of all, I just want to say this book is so well done. The design, the layout, it, I mean, it just, it just gives you pleasure as you're turning the pages and reading. It's did just, you read it? I did, yeah. No, it's, um, it's, uh, anyway, it's a beautiful book. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you, Stephanie, for the nice introduction, and thank you all for coming. I'm actually Hal, and this is Gary. Um, <laughs> So I, I thought I would talk a little bit about Sarah. Uh, he's a hometown kid. Uh, and talk a little bit about the book, and then Gary can have at me. And we wanted to get his voice into the room, too. Um, Sarah is a, a fierce interlocutor. And um, the real pleasure and the real pain of this project for me was to be um, in a dialogue with him for years that was like uh, a gladiator <laughs> battle. Um, you know, I learned so much. Um, anyway, so Richard Serra was born uh, in San Francisco in, in 1938. Uh, his father was of Spanish extraction. His mother came from a Russian Jewish family. Uh, he was born into the, um, the working class. He grew up in the sand dunes. As a teenager, worked in the steel mills in the Bay Area. Um, one of the first things he says to me is how proud he was to see the Crown Cellar back building go up because he knew that there were rivets that he had made that were uh, in the building. Uh, he has important early experiences in the city that I, I, wanted, I want to just tell you about. Uh, Sarah's very good, as many artists, many writers are, about origin stories to explain the work, explain the career. Um, and we have to believe them a bit. I mean, Gary has heard these stories too, but they're too specific to San Francisco that I want to tell you. Uh, he says that when he was three, maybe four, so right in the middle of World War II, when his father was a pipe fitter in the shipyards here, he was taken to a ship launch. And he was overwhelmed by the, the size of the ship and its weight. And then even more struck by how this hulk of a thing began to move down the waves. And he said he was terrified by this event, and as it crashed into the water, he thought it would disappear, and then it, it righted and found its balance, and this experience of, of weight and lift and balance, uh, he said it never left him, and he still dreams about this event. Uh, another San Francisco-specific story is, again, he, he grew up on the the dunes, and he said, as, a, as just a boy, uh, he decided to walk as far as he could down the beach in one direction, uh, and so he did. Uh, and at the moment when he turned, when he pivoted back uh, towards home, he felt for the first time that the world was one thing as he moved in one direction, and a entirely different world as he moved in the other direction. And that at the, when he pivoted, the world turned with him, that his body actually sutured these two worlds together. Uh, and if the first anecdote gives you a sense of how important in his early work the whole play with props, with balance and counterbalance is, uh, the second anecdote suggests his mature definition of sculpture, which is really to do with how a work will lead your body through a space in time. And it's really about your corporeal experience with the work <laughs> in space and time that is important to him. That's what sculpture is to Sarah. Anyway, uh, back to the story. <laughs> He's a very good athlete, uh, wins a scholarship to Berkeley to play football, breaks his back as a freshman, uh, discovers that the art department, he always drew, he was always interested in art, 
the art department sucked at Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> he became interested in literature, so he transferred to Santa Barbara and was very taken by the transcendentalists like Emerson and the existentialists like Camus. This is the late 1950s where existentialism was everywhere. He was also uh, taken up by two painters in the art department at Santa Barbara, two muralists, who encouraged him to go to Mexico to, to see the Mexican muralists, you know, Rivera, Orozco, Sequeiros. So he did, uh, and he was so impressed by how uh, such work uh, took on the architecture, how ambitious painting, such painting was in relation to its context, and this idea that any art should really take on uh, the architecture Stuck, stuck with him as well. Uh, he got a scholarship to Yale, which was the great uh, art school at the time. In many ways, it still is. It was but one of the can I just say, based on his drawings. On his drawings, yeah. <laughs> Gary did a drawing show, and I want to ask him about his drawing show. Uh, very important show. <clears throat> uh, so he was one of the last students of of Joseph Albers, the great. Bauhaus master, and Albers stressed in all his teaching the importance of materials, often non-art materials. You know, what does the material want to be? And I think this really stuck with Sarah. You want a, a fellowship but, or two? But, but what he did for Albers was work on the layout of the uh, Interaction of Color book, which... Yeah, <laughs> famous, famous book yeah. uh, about, well, the Interaction of Color. Uh, Which it's really it's interesting still that, that, that that's what Richard did with Albers because yeah. you know, color's not been so important in Richard's own work. Well, we should talk about this. Yeah. Yeah, these, by the way, these are all the images in the book, um, and some will be in color, but they're not in color in the book. Sarah insists uh, on black and white throughout his publications. And why that might be so is a question we could take up. Anyway, I'll, I'll yeah. rush through the story. Um, so he, he goes, goes to Europe, uh, mostly in Paris. He's still a painter at this point. He travels to Madrid, goes to the Prado, sees Velazquez, especially the Las Meninas, the great painting of the, the court, thinks, what, what more can be done with painting? <laughs> this is a painting that does everything. He ditches painting, this is at least what he tells me. Um, at that point, comes back to Paris and draws every day in the studio of Brancusi, which was given to the French state. Uh, and he's obsessed by Brancusi, obsessed by Giacometti, still very much alive. He stalks Giacometti and uh, Montparnasse. Uh, those are his two important touchstones in terms of modern sculpture. He's in Paris with Phil Glass. Sarah has a a knack, uh, he just finds the, the contemporaries that one would, would hope to find. <laughs> um, so he's, he's with the, the composer, uh, Philip Glass, in Paris. They travel some, comes back to New York after a year and a half or two, falls in again with the smartest people around. Um, Steve Reich, other great composer, minimalist composer, lives down the street. Great filmmaker Michael Snow is an early friend. Uh, hilariously, Sarah has a truck. So they decide to make money. They will become movers. And uh, he went to Yale with Chuck Close. So the movers, these guys, the, the, this group were uh, Glass, Reich, uh, Chuck Close, Michael Snow, and Spalding Gray. Um, <laughs> I mean, would you want those guys to move <laughs> anything? Um, anyway, this is a very different New York, a very different downtown. Um, one day when they're moving, um, on Canal Street, they see a rubber factory that's gone out of business and rubber is dumped on the street. And Sarah, because he has the truck and he's interested in material, asks the bereft owner if he can take the rubber away. And he does, and that becomes a crucial first material for him. It's the same with lead. Um, how does Sarah get onto lead? You know this. Yeah. How does he? 
Philip Glass was a plumber. <laughs> and, and, and he was working with lead. And Richard said, wow, that could be something interesting to, to use. Uh, and, and Glass was his, his studio assistant at that point. I mean, that's how, um, how ad hoc everything was back then. Another really important influence in New York was Judson Church Dance. Uh, Sarah goes to see uh, the choreography of Yvonne Rayner, Trisha Brown, Lucinda Child, Simone Forti. Um, you know, this, these are all you know, people who are important to San Francisco too. Yeah. Um, and that if you think about that, that dance, it's all about simple gestures, about how bodies interact, how they hold each other up. Um, his prop pieces in many ways come directly out of that sense of dance as a matter of, of lift, balance, counterbalance. Really important to him, what he picks up. And he says at one point in the book that we were, we were all makers and doers. That they didn't really think too much in terms of mediums, although he insists on sculpture. And that they were all the audience for each other. I mean, they really were devoted. He, he also went to um, the anthology film archives every night, so he says, and, and really studied film. Yeah. So that, um, you know, er, those early years, this is now mid to late 1960s, are really important in New York. And soon after a piece like this, um, <coughs> which Jasper Johns figures importantly, uh, Sarah, well, here he is, yeah. he, he breaks out into space. This is how he defines it. He, he discovers that a plate stuck in a corner will free stand, as in strike. And this is his first move, really, into the space of the gallery. And this idea that all his work must free stand. Uh, and this, this piece is more about kind of a, an opening out into that space and how different materials uh, can define it. This is his first uh, land piece. Uh, he has problems with the other earthwork artists. He's more interested in um, the manipulation of space. He feels that uh, Michael Heiser and Robert Smithson, that too much of land art is simply drawing in space. It's too graphic. So he steps away from it uh, for a bit. But we, the book takes you through the formation um, of, his, of his work, through the early stages, the break into space, the landscape work, uh, the whole idea of site specificity. Uh, we move on to the, the torque pieces, which is another great moment of invention in his work. Uh, in the latter half of the book, or the latter third, we talk more openly about his commitments in modern sculpture, sculpture of other traditions. He's very curious about other cultures. There's a chapter about his engagement with architecture. Sarah goes to architecture in part because he feels that sculpture lacks structural principles and he, he wants to draw on the tectonic strength of architectures, and which he finds in all kinds of different examples historically. Uh, so there's a whole chapter devoted to, to architecture and then eventually we get to the controversies in his career, the controversies in his, in his life, uh, most significantly Tilted Ark, the site in New York, that a uh, piece in New York that was commissioned by the government, that was also taken down by the government. The 30th anniversary of its destruction is tomorrow. Uh, so we can talk a little bit about such things if you want. Mm -hmm. um, and then we end the book with, um, you know, I, I press him on the contradictions in his work, and that gets nasty. <laughs> um, anyway, I've gone on long enough. No, no, I want to ask, I mean, I have to say, I, I've, I've known Richard, I guess I met in 79, um, really early for me, and, uh, um, and if, can people hear me? Is that, yeah, okay. Um, anyway, I, I, as you mentioned at the beginning, Richard, is just a formidable intellectual, and uh, and he uh, has very little patience for uh, pretense. He has no patience for pretense, 
uh, he's direct and uh, uh, and he, he uh, has uh, you know very strong ideas and uh, and he is just a he's a formidable person. I mean, he, I, he's also I have to say I find Richard incredibly also there's a warmth about him and an engagement. Uh, uh, you just, but you have to be absolutely honest. And if you don't know something, you have to admit it, because there's nothing worse than like pretending you know something that you don't. And so, anyway, I was just, and I've been reading the book, you know, but but I have to say, so how how did this conversation begin, and how many years? Because this, I have to say, it is a again a kind of formidable uh, accomplishment. This long series of conversations with Richard covered over a number of years and clearly the two of you have a relationship where you can be sort of really confront Richard and ask him some tough questions and have some uh, opinions that may differ from the ones he has about mm -hmm. about about his work yeah no I, I think we both understood that to make a conversation um, we had to be honest and we had to be um, clear about our disagreements. And my favorite parts, I think his too, are when we do disagree. Um, yeah, and there are the only two things that Sarah asked um, me to take out of the book. And, and one was in my preface when I said that the early conversations had the narrative arc of Godzilla meets Bambi. <laughs> and he said, who's Godzilla here? Um, <laughs> So when did yeah. those when did those conversations start? How long does this? Well, I, you know, I, it's funny. Back? I didn't know that you knew him longer than I did. I met him. Uh, I met Sarah in 1983 at the Odeon when that restaurant was still a hangout for artists and writers downtown. And and actually, he was with Frank Gehry. Uh, so I met Gary at that point too. And he, um, I think he was interested in me. I was just a, a young critic editor at Art in America, because I was um, already identified with the pictures generation. And Sarah's very, people like Cindy Sherman and Barbara Kruger, Louise Lawler, and uh, Sarah was, is so uh, rivalrous. He, he wanted to know who these new kids on the block were, and he wanted to, um, you know, in a way, see if they were a threat. Um, <laughs> so that was, you know, he really came up to me. Um, and this was just at the moment when Tilted Arc had, had gone up. I mean, it was, Tilted Arc was installed in 1981, mm. and it, w it was before the controversy. Uh, and so I, I stuck with them. I testified at the hearings about Tilted Arc. Uh, I didn't testify with the, the enthusiasm that Sarah required, so we fell out of touch for a few years. Mm -hmm. um, but we came back um, into conversation with the torque pieces in the early 1990s, and we haven't really stopped since. So we've talked um, since, well, for three decades, really. Um, but the book comes out of about two decades of conversations. We began to do talks in public, uh, and then in private, and then we discovered how much material we had. Yeah. Um, and I edited, but he is, as you say, he's, he's fiercely, um, Articulate, and you know, so it was actually fairly easy to put together as a book, because he, you know, we we really march through problems, yeah. um, and he's committed. Um, I mean, some artists don't really want to fess up, you know, they they don't really want to explicate the work. Sarah's the opposite. He's a uh, he feels that it's incumbent upon an artist to not only take a position, but to clarify the position. And that for me is, is key. Yeah, But well, that's, that's really the genesis of the thing. Yeah, well, I would say Richard interrogates himself relentlessly. Yeah, he thinks that the only way that, that art uh, develops is through critique, is through auto-critique. Yeah, and there, I have to say, I find there's an extraordinary driven internal logic within his thinking, which he then manifests itself in the way he makes his moves yeah. in, in, in his sculpture. That there's, you can just see the, the, the mind at work as he goes from one thing into the next, to the next, 
but they're pushing that envelope. I think that's true, but there also there's also the contingency of well, of clients, of sites. You know, there are the exigencies of context that um, compel him to change up the language and to invent within it. Uh, but that's absolutely that's the first criterion of art uh, for Sarah is the idea that it develop its own language and somehow make that uh, that language uh, work through different circumstances. Right. <coughs> Which um, can be a number of things. It could be process. Uh, he also talks about technology influencing the work, uh, what's possible. Um, but I think it would be interesting here to maybe, um, the, one of the things that Richard remarks upon too is that um, uh, that he can look at and be interested in art from any period. It's, he ta says that it's not as if uh, art history has a, 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 a march of one thing eliminating another, but it's a, a, a something where it's an accumulation, even though as he wants to create it in a totally new way to do something that has not been seen or done before, mm -hmm. he also uh, is acutely aware of, like you said, Velasquez or... Right. Uh, 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 Giacometti. Uh. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd be interested to hear you on the subject as a curator because for Sarah, and this, this comes up more than once in the book, um, and I think this is typical of other artists, uh, for Sarah, all art, all, all architecture is somehow present. Um, he feels that he can learn from Donatello as as well as Praxiteles, or uh, he can learn from the Hagia Sophia or a dolmen in Ireland. Um, the Zen gardens in Kyoto. Yeah, no, that uh, trip to Japan in 1970 was really important to this idea that sculpture be about a body as it moves through space in time, and that kind of move from detail to the, you know, the entire totality of the garden. That's crucial. Uh, he's always, you know, curious about other art, uh, other architecture, other times, and it's all present for him because uh, a fundamental value too, and this is uh, true of his generation, I think, is that the the experience of of art is in the experience of art. It's in the phenomenological here and now. So uh, you can come up to anything. Any work of art, any building, uh, of any time, any culture, and it, it's about your experience of it now. Uh, so that brings it all right, right to the present and how, how we're compelled, he thinks, to engage uh, in any work in the present, in, you know, with our body, in, with all our, all, you know, <coughs> all our present uh, with us. At the same time, he has this other temporality um, in the development of his work, which is that he feels that an artist must take on the most important precedence um, in his or her medium. So uh, he has a very Oedipal sense of how art develops, that you have to kill the father. And too much, uh, too often this is a real boy story, I think, but mm. there's a way in which he wants... Um, Donald Judd and Dan Flavin, you know, two artists that he felt that he had to surpass or overcome somehow. He wants them to come back so he can kill them. <laughs> you know, he's, he's that uh, intense in terms of his kind of artistic agon, you know? So that's, that's one temporality, but this other temporality is even more important, that all, all art is there to be engaged with. Yeah. But that's different for, certainly different for an art historian. Is that how you as a curator, think about art? Well, I mean, I think of, about, again, that, that all these things can exist simultaneously, and uh, you, can, you can put together different relationships that may not be intended, but you somehow may feel that there exists, exists that. I mean, I think for a curator, and maybe that is a little different than an art historian, the primary engagement is with the object, with, mm -hmm. the, with the work of art. And I think that's something curators share with artists. Right. Um, that it's uh, not the, uh, even though, again, with Richard, the, the ideas are, he's driven by ideas. Mm -hmm. 
but he is also driven by material. Right. So as as you said, one of the some of the very first sculptures were rubber because rubber was something he found. It was available. He could experiment with it. He right. could bring it back to the studio and sort of test it, kind of see what could you do with this material. What forms yeah. would it take? Yeah. What does it want to be? What does it want to be? And and then um, shortly after that, he started working with uh, rubber silicon casting. Mm -hmm. And w one of the pieces in the SF MoMA collection that uh, is a cast of uh, doors made out of a rubber or silicon kind of mix. And it was, they were doors of a warehouse near his studio. I believe it was an abandoned railroad warehouse. I can't remember for sure. But again, the... Yeah, it was just, it was just on the Hudson. It was the piers. Pier. Yeah. But again, so even really early on, uh, and then from there, I think the next step was the lead. Yeah. And again, finding out what, what can you do with lead. So this was discovered lead because it was something Phil Glass was using as a plumber. And, you know, what did he do with it? And then Richard takes it out of its functional context just as a raw material and says, well, what can I do with this? What can, what can, and, and, and one of the things I, I, that he always says, and I, I, I got this out of the book, and I hope, uh, Hal, you'll read maybe a little bit from the book, because Richard's language is also so, I think, compelling. Um, but it's... Uh, that, that, it, 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 that he's always interested in finding a new form, something that has not been seen before. Right. Um, and so with lead, uh, and we'll maybe get back to these, but you know, he starts the with the lead, the first piece is taking a melted lead. Mel lead melts at a very low melting point. I think it's the lowest melting point of any metal. And then, so, and then once the heat's off, it immediately starts solidifying. So he's, the first piece that he does with the lead is melting it and throwing it into the corner, uh, the meeting point between the floor and the wall. And it's that pressure point in architecture and seeing what will happen there. And the, basically, it's the, the visual destruction of that corner and then the lead setting up mm -hmm. and then pulling that lead out and that's the first one from the uh, Castelli Warehouse show yeah. in 68, where it's just in the space itself. And then he decides he can repeat that action and see what happens through the repetition of action and the building up of form and then prying it out of the corner and pushing it into the space and repeating that action. Um, and, uh, and then, you, so, and there's, so there's just, again, this kind of logic that just keeps yeah. running through. Yeah, the so work. logic of materials and processes. I mean, by the way, uh, perhaps the best collection of early work uh, by Sarah is at the SF MoMA. So I encourage none, you to none, encourage Gary to get of, it out. Yeah, none of which is on view. Clearly, but, <laughs> well, but it, it's, it's there. It's, it's been there. it's been there. It's been up. We you know we have to give other artists a chance every now and then too. Yeah, we, <laughs> Sarah is a space guzzler. Maybe we can talk about that yeah. too at one point. But um, yeah, there there's uh, there's a way in which um, Sarah felt that he could get beyond minimalists like Judd and Flavin uh, through this attention to material and process. Yeah. So the verb list, which you will see, is very important in his career. It gets him yeah. started with actual activities in relation to materials like, like lead. And he, um, he says that you know, artists like Judd, uh, they're shiny minimalists. Whereas you know, my group, and he counts as, among, here's the verb list, among his group, uh, Bruce Nauman, Robert Smithson, Eva Hess, he also sneaks in Andy Warhol. He says, we are the, the down and dirty minimalists. Um, yeah, but he does, he does give it up to one, um, yes. one minimalist, uh, Carl Andre. And let me just read, once you get your phone. Um, <laughs> maybe it's Sarah. Uh, so this is Sarah on Carl Andre. He says, I was very interested in Andre because he always dealt with the physicality of matter. Different kinds of wood, different kinds of metal. He went through the whole chart. Copper, lead, zinc, aluminum, magnesium. One day I said to Carl, look, somebody's got to get those plates up off the floor. And he looked at me, smiled, and said, don't worry, Richard, somebody will. 
I thought, oh God, I better do it. <laughs> so I took four lead plates. If you put the four of them together, they weigh a ton, and dragged them up to my studio one at a time in the elevator. I thought by leaning them together and overlapping them at the top edge, I could get them to free stand. It's really important to Sarah. And when I did, it looked like a house of cards. Even though it seemed it might collapse, in fact, it stood up. You could see through it, look into it, walk around it, and I thought, there's no getting around it. This is sculpture. Now, was it sculpture as sculpture had been heretofore known? No. But was I willing to stake my belief on what I was up to, on unattached lead plates propped up against each other, weighing a ton, and always about to implode, to stake my belief on them being sculpture? Yes. Just as much as Andre was when he laid one brick after the other to make lever, and people yelled at him, that's not art. The stakes were very serious and very high. A lot of what we were doing downtown was experimental, but that doesn't mean we didn't know what the historical responsibilities were. I was thinking about Brancusi and Giacometti. I looked at them every day when I was in, in Paris. Closer to home, I was thinking about John's and a host of others. We knew what the odds were in terms of finding our own way of doing and making that was going to challenge what came before us. I think all of us felt that what we, what we needed to do to make our own syntax to define ourselves as artists, not to make somebody else's work, to make our own. I got divorced over House of Cards. Nancy Graves, his wife at the time, asked if I was going to show it as sculpture. I said yes, and she said she couldn't live with me anymore. <laughs> okay, and I have the, another version of that story. <laughs> Uh, because uh, in the Fisher Collection is a later version of House of Cards, which is slightly larger than the, the first time he did it. And uh, when we did the drawing, when I did the, did the drawing show with Richard, we have this piece, which is a later rendering of the splashing piece. It's up, and it's on view with the Via Selman show. It disappears behind a wall sometimes. Sometimes it comes out. It's there now if you want to see it on the fourth floor. It's permanent. It was made on the site. Um, and when we did the drawing show, I thought, well, we've got House of Cards, we've got the splashing piece sort of anchored and to give people a little sense of where, sort of where Richard was coming from in his thought process, and then did a big gallery of rubber and the cast resin pieces and these different, and, and uh, leather. Um, and, uh, and I was walking through with Richard and we're at the House of Cards and he says, yes, when I first did this piece, I was married to Nancy Graves. And she said to me, well, that's not sculpture. And he said, well, then you're not my wife. <laughs> so it was a little different narration than what appears in the book. Uh, so I don't know, that was maybe off the record. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, it was pretty similar to what you just yeah. read. Yeah. Uh, um, formidable. Yeah. So I wanted, um, yeah, go ahead. You have another no, no, you go. passage? <laughs> No, but while we're, again, this splashing piece, which is so fundamental, it's a kind of, again, an origin um, story. So when, um, and so he did that piece for a show at a Costelli, a Leo Costelli had a warehouse and they did a show of these early, and I would say they, they were, we, we would call, I would call them post-minimalists. Sure. You know, Hesse, Nauman, yeah. um, and, and that, um, <clears throat> that process and and the and again the the <clears throat> the inherent quality of those materials was really fundamental, and right. and that they were related actually to the to the human body and the organ organic forms. It was like where the minimalists had tried to get the body as far away as possible. Richard and this generation were trying to embrace right. the relationship to the body. And even in that first splashing piece. Um, there's a relation to architecture. So yes, absolutely. Implicit there is already this move uh, into space um, and this agon with with architecture. It, I mean, Sarah has, has drawn on architecture again for structural reasons, but there's also a, um, a real conflict there. He w really wants to uh, take on architecture uh, and in many ways to expose it when it's not fully transparent in its own structure and production. Right. Um, and again, it's the relationship of the body in space, which is a relationship to, yeah. the, to the objects he's making, but it's also to the architectural right. frame, or as he goes out into the environment, 
You know, uh, just because it's up on the screen right yeah. now, you mentioned your interest in prime objects. For Sarah, this is one of uh, his prime objects because he, he sees a connection between this very early piece where he simply had a sheet of rubber and lifted it up and it free stood. So he said, well, is that sculpture? Maybe, maybe not, but yes. Um, that that formed a, a topology, a, a continuous surface. And that um, idea comes back years later in the, in the torqued pieces, this idea of a sculpture, which is all, if you like, surface. So one thing that we, we talk about, and I mentioned it because you said you were interested in it, is this um, idea of prime objects, which is um, an idea uh, from the great uh, Mesoamerican art historian um, George Kubler, uh, who wrote a, a book very influential to, to Sarah Smith and many others called The Shape of Time in the early 1960s. And he develops this idea of uh, how a tradition of art shifts in relation to, to particular inventions, particular innovations, which Kubler calls prime objects. And it's led Sarah to think about, you know, now that he's worked for over 60 years, uh, to think about the prime objects in his own career. I mean, works that uh, triggered a whole new line of work, works to which he can return to develop new work. Um, it's an important idea in his, his process. Yeah. Yeah, I actually, because it's uh, so compelling, I, have to say, I had never encountered this term in relationship to Richard until the reading of the mm -hmm. book. And, but Richard himself defines it as inventing something that is not anticipated. Right. Yeah, that, that sense on radical, that, that value of radical innovation, that's absolutely key to Sarah. You know, when he uh, thinks about significant artists, that's... That's the criterion. Yeah, um, and that and the prime th those, those those innovations don't displace other innovations. You know, he says, right. you know, Cezanne does not displace Manet, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that one can still draw from all of them, right. but they all need to qualify as great for him. And you know, we can talk about his fetish of the master, the masterpiece. But to qualify as great, they have to innovate within the art. Right. But they also have to, then the prime object allows, allows more invention. Yeah. That, like with that rubber it. piece. So the rubber piece was just from manipulating the rubber and suddenly there's a form that hadn't existed before, a sculpture that hadn't existed before. But that sculpture is there and embedded then within Richard's work so that he can circle back to it and revisit it and turn it into something else later, which are... Right. The, basically the torqued ellipses. Yeah, I mean, th this is perhaps the most elaborate yeah. of the torque pieces. This is in LACMA in, in Los Angeles. But let me just share another ep epiphany um, that he relates uh, in the book. And this has to do with architecture. And it's about how to get to another prime object, if you like. Uh, this occurred much later than the San Franciscan ones. Um, when he's about 50, he's in Rome, and he goes to uh, one of the masterpieces of Baroque architecture, the uh, San Carlo uh, Church by Borromini. Uh, and it, there's a slide, it might come up again, um, but the, the composition of this church, for all its complicated surfaces, is quite simple. There's an ellipse on the floor, and floor is an ellipse and the ceiling is an ellipse. Sarah came in to the church uh, by a side aisle uh, and he thought that these two ellipses were torqued, were twisted in relation to each other. And he felt that he had never experienced that, that space in nature or in architecture. And he wanted to recreate it. And that, that was the beginning of the torque pieces from the early 1990s on, and yeah. that's a series of work that yeah. continues. But he also refers it back to that first piece to lift, where he just simply took a, that sheet of rubber and yeah. lifted it up. Um, and just like the visit to Kyoto and seeing yeah. the gardens there was what really 
led him to the first work out in the landscape to take him out yeah, of to architecture the, to the importance of of sight and um, you know Sarah's in many ways the inventor of the idea of uh, sight specificity and you know one well, of in, his in our time yeah <laughs> sure 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 uh, but when we speak when we use this term yeah. it, it refers in, in many ways to his his development the, of the idea. The Baroque artists were pretty good at it too. Yeah. <laughs> um, Caravaggio maybe. <laughs> but, you know, his, his definition was yeah. really um, developed in large part in relation to Tilted Ark. Many people think that that sculpture just sat on the site, on the plaza, Federal Plaza in Lower Manhattan, but it's actually embedded in the site. It's, it's a section of a cone, not a cylinder. So it, it's actually embedded pale, that's, this is the term Sarah uses in the site. So that for Sarah to move such a sculpture, to move to the dark, is to destroy it. And that became his definition, his negative definition of site specificity. Right. If, you, if you move a site specific work, you destroy it. And that was his claim right, in well, relation to that piece. Yeah, and I have to say, I did, I did see that piece and spent some time with it. Um, after it first went in, I'd moved to New York in 1984, and, and that was like something to really explore. And it, it was, as you said, the cone, but it was also all the, it was about the relationships between the buildings and the plaza, and it was taking the whole thing as a gestalt. And by adding that piece of large curved plate of steel, it suddenly changed the, those relationships in that place, and they suddenly, this was a very unorganized space. Yeah. It was a very awkward, oddball set of le like kind of leftover space. From um, and by t doing the tilted arc, he suddenly made it meaningful within this this space and made made the space have a legibility that you never would have had before. The unfortunate part was that you couldn't traverse the plaza anymore. Well, and you had to go around it. You, yeah, you had to make a big detour. And if you were working in that building or any of those buildings every day and going out for lunch, whatever, you sort of had a forced march, and which over very quickly became uh, uh, um, uh, a lot of angry workers. Over yeah, and this. there was there was a hearing, and I I mentioned I testified at the hearing, but eventually the the piece was taken down and. By his lights destroyed yeah. 1989. Let me can I just read um, yeah. from this moment because yeah. we we disagree on the on the question of sight, um, and I think for me this is an important moment in the book. So I I quote him. Said in 1985, this is just when the hearings about Tilderark began. You wrote, "I do not necessarily worry about the indigenous community." I'm not going to concern myself with what they consider to be adequate, appropriate solutions. I mean, this is, in a way, the difference between a sculptor and an architect. You made that statement before artists had done much to develop the social aspects of site specificity. Still, it reads provocatively today, to Sarah. I'll, st I'll stand by that one, even if it pisses a lot of people off. For me, the whole idea that art is democratic is nonsense. I've gotten a lot of flack for that position. If you cater to the demographics of a given context, you risk serving ever-fluctuating political positions. You become a pawn in shifting ideological arguments. This is me. Might it be that you're so inside your language, so attuned to its nuances, that you're not always alert to conditions that are already there, embedded in the context, conditions that are social, economic, and political, does your very insistence on the formal, structural, and phenomenological aspects of your sculpture end up being a way inadvertently to deflect certain realities of urban life, even though you say the experience of those realities is a primary concern of your work? Sarah, I'll restate what I previously said. <laughs> if you go into a community to make a work and you try to follow the demands of the local people, which are never homogenous anyway, you end up serving their interests more than your own, and usually their interests are transitory. Most of those communities change over time, the demographics shift, politics change, political representatives change, so you have to hold fast to your own work. Me, 
But don't you then divide sight from context, treating sight as primarily physical and context as primarily social, privileging the former and bracketing the latter? No, I'm dealing with context. I'm just not treating the community as the preeminent arbiter of context. That's the difference. Me, but why, why assume the community isn't the preeminent arbiter? So I, there's one, I have to say there's one piece of Richard's that I find uh, incredibly emotionally moving, and it certainly is about physical context, but it's also about uh, history and morality and place. And uh, I was on the committee that selected art and artists for the, um, um, the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, lobbied very hard that Richard should do something in that museum. Uh, and I had a couple of allies in that. Uh, and Richard proposed a piece. How many people have been to the Holocaust Museum? So at the bottom of the stairs, there's this massive slab that just cuts into the building, and it is at the, the, at the, the you know, the base, the bottom of the building, right. and and it's this wrenching of architecture. And as you mentioned, Richard's mother was Jewish, and I think that 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 there's there's some part of that identity that is important to Richard and that Absolutely. history. And he was actually very interested in doing this piece, doing a work for the Holocaust Museum. Mm -hmm. And to me, that piece is, is perfectly attuned to the site, the architecture, the physical context, but it also has a, a metaphorical and emotional value that I think is not typically what one thinks about with Sarah's sculpture. Yeah, I mean, there is a, a dialectic in his work between weight and weightlessness. I mean, the, the curvy pieces, the torque pieces, are uh, almost lift you up. Uh, they're very fast. But the counterpoint to such pieces are pieces like Gravity and the Holocaust Museum, where he goes back to that experience of the ship launch, you know, right. the, the weight. Um, and that's come back strongly in his, his work, too. I mean, he, he's done other pieces, um, a beautiful piece called The Drowned and the, si the, slave, the Saved, the, mm. an allusion to Primo Levi, of course. A um, uh, very simple piece, just two right angles that abut and support each other, as perhaps The Drowned and the Saved in, in Levi do through memory. Um, that piece was first installed in a uh, synagogue in Germany. So it, you know, there, there are different right. moments in his work where he's reflected uh, in his own formation, his own family, his own history. But it's, it's always through his language. It's always oh. through um, abstraction, you know, that insistence on, on an abstract syntax. He's also very involved in the, um, the memorial in Berlin uh, with Peter Eisenman. If you, if you know that sea of stelae, of, of pillars, um, near the Brandenburg Gate, you know that that's more Sarah than, than uh, Eisenman, really. Um, but Sarah withdrew because Helmut Kohl, uh, the chancellor at the time, wanted to cut, uh, cut the, the area of the memorial down, and uh, Sarah refused. And he felt that as an artist, began this insistence that one should not have to deal uh, with politicians. Uh, and he's had other controversies <laughs> with politicians. He, he felt that you know that Eisenman, as the architect, could stick it out, but he, as an artist, had to withdraw just ethically. Oh. But there there are, are these moments when he deals with history, um, but he does so through his own abstract language. Yeah. You know, we should open it up to questions. But I I um. I wanted to read a little bit more and. You know, on this very subject of weight, of gravity, um, and how it's, it's come back um, in his own work recently. Uh, you know, Sarah turned 80 just when, just about when the book um, appeared. 
Uh, he's not well right now. He's you know very, very strong as a personality. He was stressed, but he's he's not well. He has three shows opening in uh, September. Yeah, well, <laughs> he, <laughs> something he carries on. He has a, actually a very tricky form of cancer. Yeah. Uh, but this this state, you know, his condition now has led him to think about a late style and. I posed this to him several years ago, and he wouldn't have anything to do with the concept. But uh, in a recent conversation, which comes towards the end of the book, he does. I say, do you think that with your recent work, you've entered a late style? Yes. What does the term mean for you? More emphasis, more weight, more density, more tension, more introspection. More austerity, I ask him. Maybe more emotion. And I... But then in this academic way, I mentioned the classic examples of late style, you know, late quartets of Beethoven, you know, very austere, very dissonant. Matisse, you know, returned to fundamentals, but with great delight. So I asked him, in this return, do you feel more asperity or more, more delight? I feel both. I've gone back to forging, and weight has re-entered the proposition strongly with all its symbolic connotations. Some of the heavier pieces make some of the curvilinear work less evocative to me emotionally. The forge works register on a different psychological level. Am I conscious that this is late work? Yes. I've done a lot of drawings over the last several years. They're a return too. I ask him, to what? What do you want to reclaim there? The nuance of the experience of making, the sheer pleasure derived from the activity of drawing. Your early commitment to the intersection of material and process too? Yes. What's the relation between the sense of austerity in your recent work, you call it weight, and the sense of mortality in your life? I think it's one and the same. To what extent is the interest in the fundamental in the bare, the contemplation of my own death, to a great extent? Different artists respond differently, this is me. Picasso became even more manically productive. We don't know what he was thinking, this is Sarah. We don't know what Matisse was thinking either, nor Titian, nor Cezanne. I think late work is very important. It makes you reevaluate the entire body of an artist's work. It's very important for me to make that review as substantial as I can. It's not about repeating, it's about analyzing. This is me. It's not necessarily involuted. It can open up a language. Sarah, hopefully because this is when judgment occurs. If artists fall off in their late work, their earlier work is reevaluated. <laughs> um, but let me just, let's just end um, our bit, anyway, of the conversation uh, with his thoughts about his own posterity. And this, I have to say, um, you know, moved me. I mean, Richard usually antagoniz- antagonizes me. Sarah antagonizes me. He doesn't moved me, but this, this moved me. I asked him about you know, how he's influenced artists and architects and others. He says, how has my work been assimilated, if at all? Probably by misinterpretation. <laughs> Did some people take advantage of it in ways I couldn't foresee? Yes. Do I th- think the work is open enough to allow people to deal with it in a lot of different ways? I hope so. Artists, sculptors and architects will figure it out. Some performers, dancers, and others will find it useful. Or again, that's my hope. Duchamp said that you're lucky if you get 30 or 40 years. Of course, he's had a lot longer. (laughs) Warhol said all we get is 15 minutes. Who knows? The fact is, you can't know. In the end, I still believe that matter imposes its form on form. That's why it's important for me to stick with materials I understand. It's actually, um, I think, a fairly modest assessment of his own (laughs) importance. Um, I think we both agree, I I certainly feel, that Sarah is a world historical artist. But, and this is a real contradiction, um, I think, and I I did not take it up in the book because I I think it it would be... uh, you know, too difficult for him to take on. I think he's um, a world historical artist without much influence on other artists. He does say um, that 
you know, this kind of work would be impossible for a young artist to take on now. It involves um, too much material, too much capital, and we talked about his relation to the, to the neoliberal economy all around us. Um, it would just take too much effort to deal with all the contingencies, all the clients um, that he's had to deal with. And I think that's, that's right. Um, it's a, yeah. For me, it's a paradox. You know, world historical, but influential, who knows? But I, I think it will stick around. Yeah, I, I'm not sure because I have to say, young artists, a lot, most of them start at the same place, which is they don't have much money and, uh, and you deal with whatever is at hand in, in terms mm -hmm. of sculpture and raw material. And, and you know, what do you do to that material? And um, I actually think Richard, be, because of that early work, which didn't require capital, right. but required invention and imagination and right. a kind of intellectual, uh, like, you know, just this pushing himself constantly, questioning, intellectually demanding. But work like this. Yeah, but no, but work like this, yeah. I mean, but there are very few uh, mills that can that make yeah. the... The, the torque work anymore, or indeed even the yeah. forge work. Right. But maybe we should open it up. Yeah, but te again, technology, the, he made the forged block, the Berlin block, because the technology was there and he was said like, I want to work with that technology and test it and take it to its limits. Yeah. So it's, he, right. I mean, Richard, I have to say, I find Richard has an incredible logic and a coherence to the work, but it also, he does have contradictions and uh, ambiguities and and it, it, he does he's I think it was Mies van der Rohe who said uh, 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 consistency is the hobgoblin of small minds <laughs> something like well, it may not Lots have been of people Mies, said it yeah but uh, it's a and Richard is not that yeah, right. <laughs> he he allows himself places and spaces to test his own ideas and maybe to to contradict himself, I, th right. I think. Yeah, that goes right to you. Yeah, so. Uh, any questions or yeah. comments? I'm gonna start the first one right here in front. I assume that uh, when you met Richard with Frank Geary at the Odeon, was that in Los Angeles or Santa Monica? No, no, it was in New York, okay. um, Tribeca. And interestingly, uh, that the two merged together at the Bilbao, you know, Yeah. I mean, Gary's the torque of architecture, and um, Richard is the torque of sculpture. Yeah, no, there there was a, a time, I think, when the relationship was a very dynamic one. Mm -hmm. um, on the other hand, I think for Sarah, Gary is not structural enough. Um, right. You know, he had an, an exhibition um, soon after Bilbao was opened at, at Bilbao, Sarah did. And my wife and our kids and I went as, you know, good groupies, I suppose. Um, and Sarah said to me, this was in the early 1990s, mid-1990s, Sarah um, took me around the building and, and said, you know, you can open up this building with a can opener. <laughs> and for him... That was an insult. So I, I think they, they learn quite a bit from each other, and the whole um, development of the torque pieces uh, depended on Katia, on computer-aided design, which he, he learned in part from Gary. And Gary learned it in part from, you know, the creation of dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. I mean, so there, there is this connection, but um, now it's, they've diverged quite a bit. But you're right about the, uh, the the curvy lines. I mean, Sarah says at one point in the book, um, it might be hard for architecture simply to be rectilinear anymore after this opening to toric spaces. Well, again, that was what computers allowed that you couldn't yeah. have done and, before. And new and production it, systems yeah, and the same too. With, with Richard, with some of these later works, that the, the technology allowed him, enabled him. Yeah, to do those things. That That's one of the real contradictions in his work that you know, insistence on industrial materials and processes and post-industrial means, and indeed a post-industrial economy, 
So is there a particular reason that you left uh, Richard Serra's works on paper out of the book? I didn't read the book yet, but by the title, well, I read the book. guessing. Yeah. <laughs> I got Buy the it. book and then read it. Um, about, yeah, yeah um, we have done conversations about the drawing, but we decided to focus on the sculpture. Gary is the one to speak about the drawing. He did well. this fabulous show uh, of the Sarah drawings, 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a retrospective. And maybe you could take this one. Well, I, um, drawing is fundamental to Richard. I, you know, I mean, at the beginning, that's how he got into Yale was through his drawings. He dries, draws all the time. He always has a little sketchbook with him. Yeah. He's always looking and 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 drawing, and those things then generate uh, ideas and places to go and think. You know, kind of in his mind, they're very different. Uh, you know, because the the drawings they certainly have a, a lot of physicality, but they're they're not about space. Uh, and, mm, they, and they press on your body in a way, but well, yeah, and. Um, and there's certainly, anyway, I mean, I can get into you're talking again about relationships to architecture and relationships to the body and so on, but they're, they're just, they're, by and large, they're, 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 they're a different kind of experience. And you know, one thing that's important to know about Sarah, I think, is that he doesn't draw before a sculpture. He will draw copiously after a sculpture. He'll draw a sculpture, but he doesn't make preparatory drawings. He his drawing is is really um, a a little kind of pan of sand, which in which he sticks wedges, uh, little pieces of of uh, lead and and steel. Um, he doesn't want the work to be an image. No, but he, you know, certainly not before, maybe not even after. Like for a long time, he he didn't want reproductions of his work from above that would turn it into a graphic uh, element, an image too quickly. He thinks that the, the work then would be taken away from our, our bodies somehow, that we'd get it as a picture in our minds before we experience it in our bodies. Yeah, but he uses, again, paint stick is this material that he used where he made these blocks of it. It's not the way typically pe people get it. And he tur turned it into something else that nobody else had ever done. Yeah. And, and, uh, and again, the physicality, the testing of what's possible with that material, which is the same kind of attitude he takes towards sculptural yeah. materials. Is, yeah. is, there's an analogy there with the drawing. But he also sketches. That's the other part. It's, they're two different practices yeah. where he will look at the sculpture and to understand what's there and what the space is and the relationships he'll go in and, and, and work it out. And that's also how he explores, uh, for me, uh, like he did this, I was, when I was working on the drawing retrospective, I mean, his, in his living loft studio, and he says, oh, well, there's a sketchbook we should look at. And he brings out a sketchbook, and then he brings out another sketchbook, and then he brings out a, a huge thing full of sketchbooks, and you realize there's this whole room in his studio that's filled with a lifetime of sketchbooks. And, and he pulls out the sketchbooks he did when he went to Ronchamp, right. the Corbusier Chapel that is... Yeah, that's a key, that's a key moment for him, that yeah. encounter with that um, And how he church. tried to understand that, that space and that structure and so on. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember what year that was. Do you remember when he went? It wasn't when he was a young man. It no. was in his 50s, yeah. 40s or 50s. But how that plays into the the arcs and so on, I'm, I'm mm -hmm. sure there's some relationship there. Yeah. yeah. More questions? I was um, <clears throat> reminded of a sign that I saw in the MoMA uh, that I think uh, was inspired by the primal shapes. Uh, was, the sign said, it is not art because I made it, it's art because I chose it. And I wondered if that might have been a quote of his. No, I don't think so. so. Yeah. Um, that is a quote, roughly, from his great um, enemy, who is Duchamp. Uh, for Sarah, the opposite of what he wants to do is a ready-made. What, what Duchamp 
said um, in 1917 when he posed the urinal as a work of art in an exhibition in New York and called it Fountain. Um, he said in defense uh, that the artist, uh, it's a work of art because the artist chose it. So for Duchamp, um, the, act, the most important act in art is nomination as art. You know, the artist has the authority uh, to declare it art. And that sets up you know, questions that thousands, maybe millions of artists have explored ever since. You know, what, what's the definition of art? Who gets to decide? What's the institution of art? Et cetera, et cetera. For Sarah, that tradition is a big problem. Is it, it assumes that we know what art might be. It, it doesn't really get to materials and processes. It doesn't, it, the ready-made for him is the enemy. He, you know, he, he might take rubber that he finds or he might take lead that he finds, but he wants to uh, expose it, melt it, <laughs> reform it. Nothing is ready-made in his work. But he also, you know, there is a way, I mean, I think you're on to a point here. This is his official position, but he might be closer to Duchamp than he thinks because mm -hmm. there is a way in which he uses his authority to declare his new inventions as art. Like when he said of the House of Cards, you know, ah, this is sculpture. Was it sculpture to others at the time? No, I mean, that's his point in part. But he didn't find it as a ready-made. He didn't simply choose it, he made it. Time for just two more questions. I yep. uh, wanted to let everybody know that Hal is going to be signing books in the back of the room right after the program. Yeah, I, I uh, photographed uh, Richard for Time Magazine in 1985 in front of the Tilted Art. Great. Uh, for, and he told me, he said, if they take this down, he's going to renounce his citizenship. <laughs> so the thing I think you haven't addressed here is his sort of arrogance. <laughs> and he's an extremely arrogant person. And his, his sculpture is extremely arrogant. I mean, the scale, the size, taking damp pieces of buildings out. I mean, the Tilted Ark is a perfect example, and you, you, you addressed that, where people had to walk all the way around it. I yeah. mean, he didn't really care yeah. about the people in the building. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that you need to address his arrogance in order to understand his sculpture. That's a strong statement. Um, and I, I, think it, I think you're right. I mean, I... Um, I think, I think that's a position that one can assume. Uh, but I also think that we need to understand what it was like to be uh, or to feel under attack at that moment. This was a piece that was commissioned by the government that the government wanted to take down, again, in his lights, to destroy. Uh, and the world did divide into two for Sarah at that time, you know, people who were for the Tilted Ark and people who were opposed to it. And, you know, perhaps he was born arrogant. He, you know, he, he developed in a very intense family. His older brother is Tony Sarah, who's a legend in the Bay Area. So you can imagine what it was like to grow up in such a family where you, you almost need to be arrogant to survive and to claim the attention of parents um, who were ambitious, you know, for the, their three sons. Yeah. Uh, no, you're you're absolutely right. He's he's yeah. a very arrogant person, but part of that arrogance is um, a demand to be taken seriously. A demand uh, that his um, language of sculpture, which he wants to make as open as possible, even though he says that it's not democratic. That's about the citing of the work. And that's, you know, that's a real concern. But it's democratic uh, in the sense that he wants people to understand it. He wants people to see what the material is, what the process is. He doesn't want anything to be obscure. And I think that's not arrogant. That's, that's, there's an, a, an openness in that desire for transparency. Maybe it's, it doesn't come across. Um, but yeah, no, that's, he, will also, he also says in the book, because I, I question him about um, his posture in the world <laughs> and the way in which so many people see his, his work as arrogant or indeed as aggressive. 
for Sarah, the, that's to do in, in part, maybe in large part, with the media image of Sarah the artist. And he says, I have no control over that image. Um, but I, I, you know, I, I don't disagree with your statement. Yeah, but I would just, do you want to say something further? No. Oh, no. I would just say that Richard is, is absolutely unrelenting in his own, I guess, interrogation of himself. And, and the, again, he's like sets the bar so high for himself. And he, I think he forgets that other people don't always set the bar so high. And, um, and um, he just, he makes such demands on himself and he makes demands on art as we talked before that it's, you know, what he, he is, he loves what's happened before, you know, whether it's the gardens in Kyoto or Velasquez or whatever, I mean, Giacometti. And, but he, what he's trying to do is to carry this great, these, this great tradition, the histories of civilization to move it forward in some way that it is, that he feels a responsibility that he embodies to, to carry culture forward in our own time at a level of rigor and invention that he has found in the past. So, and I, you know, I, I, it's, he's just incredibly demanding. And, you know, and I, I don't think that necessarily everybody uh, wants to participate it, you know, in that way. And, and he does make, and because he is, phys, you know, doing things physically in the environment, they can be quite uh, um, uh, intrusive and, you know, yeah. and, and the Tilted Arc is the, by far the, was the most intense example of that kind of intrusion into or, or taking over a public space uh, for his own purposes. And I've, I found it incredibly moving when I saw it, but I could also understand the frustration of the people who had to live and work there every day. Yeah, unfortunately, it really d divided the public, you know, downtown into two. <laughs> two. We're going to anyway. take the last question right here. As the last question, I'll simply say thank you so very much for um, coming and speak with us. Um, I'm curious if you could say something about the very... Um, strong decisive piece that he has that we have of his here in mission bay at the ucsf campus can you tell us a little about how that where that piece fits into the rest of his work and and whether he does whether he made that piece as a site-specific piece for that place or was it put there by others and i, I just mm -hmm. whatever you could tell us about that piece yeah no it, i mean gary um i don't know all the history of it i have to say yeah so. i mean it it's an important line in his work, the, the tower pieces. It, it really goes back to House of Cards again, this idea uh, of a, a piece that can freestand. I mean, for Sarah, all the pieces should be able to freestand. I mean, sometimes for reasons of code, they have to be embedded. But um, these towers, uh, he feels, are, are structurally sound. So the towers are... are um, an important, really important um, line in his work. And in many ways, they are the, the complement <coughs> to the horizontal interventions in the landscape that he also makes, like Clara Clara. So they're, um, in a way, the, the urban type of his monumental sculpture, even though he hates the word monumental. And I, uh, you know, that's a piece that I think um, it's not absolutely clear how site-specific mm -hmm. it is. Could it be cited elsewhere? I think he would say it could be. Mm -hmm. It's certainly site-sensitive, and it would be um, very tricky to move it. I think it's made for that site, but I'm not sure that to move it would be to destroy it. Yeah. That's, you know, that's really the test. Uh, and I, I, to be honest, I, I really don't know how he would feel about it. But I, I do know that it's an important piece. And I think, you know, if you're, if you're interested in this work, if you like it, you're lucky to, to live in the Bay Area because between Stanford, you know, sequence now at back at Stanford, it was just at SF MoMA, uh, 
to the uh, the boxcars piece in the landscape at Oliver Ranch. You know, you have a, a an extraordinary, and then the the collection at your museum, you have an extraordinary cut of his work. And, um, you know, he's a hometown kid. He did leave early, but I think it's important that he be represented so well here. It's important for him, and God knows I, I hope for you too. Yeah. There's no quite a lot of a lot of Richard's work is very challenging to, you know, somebody who has doesn't come into the conversation or come you know into the work with a uh, any understanding of where he's coming from or what those issues are for him or for for art, art history, architecture, and so on. Uh, they are, I, I I don't know if arrogant is the right word, but there's there's a, there is an a uh, you know there's an aggressiveness about their presence often. So yeah. Although I think that those are, I mean, I have to say, sequence to me is not aggressive, and the uh, snake eyes and box cars is, is is not aggressive. Although it may be an aggressive intrusion into that landscape. I mean, it's it's pretty pretty fierce mm -hmm. uh, in some ways. But. Fierce is good. <laughs>